I don't know if you've ever been pulled over and accused of being uh, driving under the influence, getting a DUI. Uh, if that's never happened to you, it's something you don't want to happen to you. Why? Because uh, if they can convict you of that, you're going to go to jail. Now, if you were a Christian and you were pulled over for living under the influence, would there be enough evidence to convict you of living under the Holy Spirit's influence? That's, that's another way to stop and think about that. Because the reality is, as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we're supposed to be living under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And we're supposed to be living under his control. That means that the words we speak, the actions we have, the attitudes we hold toward one another are supposed to be under the direct influence and the direct control of God who lives in us. Isn't that what we claim? That's exactly what we claim. As followers and believers, we claim that because we've trusted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, God the Holy Spirit has moved in and we are now living under his direct control and his direct influence. If that were true for each and every one of us, then I would imagine our churches would look much different. Our lives would look much different. So we've got to ask ourselves the question, what are we missing? What are we missing? Tonight, I want us to address the issue of what does it mean to live under the control of the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to live under his influence? If you've got your Bibles with you tonight, I encourage you to turn to the book of Ephesians. As you're turning there, let me just begin to read Ephesians chapter five, beginning in verse eight. Listen to what Paul says. He's speaking to the church. And previously in verse one, the apostle Paul had this admonition. He says, I say to you, live or walk by the spirit. Okay, this is a command that you and I are to do. And then in verse eight, Paul begins to elaborate on what he meant. And, and why it's so crucial. He said, for once, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In parentheses, the New King James Version has this. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. He said, once you were darkness, you were lost. You were apart from Christ. But now, because of your faith and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've now been brought out of the dark and into the light. And now, he said, you need to learn to walk or to live as children of the light. And, and then he elaborates on what that means and what that looks like. He said, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness righteousness, and truth. I'm, not, I, I, I'm, I'm appreciative of the fact that Paul didn't say the fruits of the Spirit. But he spoke of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 as being singular in nature, plural in context, singular in nature, nature but yet plural in context. Because if we have the Holy Spirit in us, residing in us, then the fruit of the Spirit is gonna be made evident, it's gonna be made manifest in the lives of those who are indwelt by Him. Okay, remember what we said this morning. Your life is not your own anymore. You've been bought with a price, and that price was the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so therefore, our lives are to reflect that new nature in all that we say and do. In verses 10 and 11, the apostle Paul goes on to say this, and he said, and find out what pleases the Lord. Find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Now, here's a question I wanna ask. How do you find out what pleases the Lord? Ask him, 
Okay, that's a great place to start. Ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do? In this situation, in this circumstance, how do you want me to respond? Oftentimes, I, I ask Desi first. <laughs> she, she's, a, she's a great filter for me because I, I can be impulsive and I can, I can respond quicker than I should. And so oftentimes I'll speak to her and then I'll speak to the Lord about it. And if they're in agreement, then I'll follow. Usually, that puts a lot of pressure on your spouse, doesn't it? But you know what? If we're one flesh, then God's gonna, he's not gonna speak two different messages to the two of us. So how does one find out what is pleasing to the Lord? Okay, you read his word, you talk to him, you ask him, you ask other believers. But you've got a resource right here inside of you who is to teach you how to live, how to walk, how to respond in each and every situation. And this is so crucial because the days we're living in, there is more and more contrast between the darkness and the light, but yet we don't see that being reflected in the lives of those who call themselves believers. And so Paul said, Find out what pleases the Lord. And I want you to jump down to verse 18. I was reading in Jim Cimbala's new book, Spirit Rising. And, and he had a chapter in here that I'm going to be sharing some out of tonight. Um, because I felt like he was onto something that I think we have oftentimes overlooked. And in verse 18, in the New Living Translation, I like the way that it's worded. It says, do not be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. The King James says it leads to debauchery. He said, instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, here, here's the question I, I wanted us to wrestle with. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit isn't a gas. He isn't water. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's God. So what does it mean when Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. How is one filled with the Holy Spirit? And as a matter of fact, in the context, in the Greek language, it, it's, not, it's not just a one-time occurrence, but this is a continual infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It, it's, it means to be continuously being filled with the Holy Spirit. It, it, it implies continual action. So, how does one do this? What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because I believe that this is God's will for the New Testament church. This is God's will for believers and followers of Jesus Christ that we would be living a life that is continually being filled like a well springing up from within us. Just as Jesus said in the gospel of John chapter six, Jesus said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink and springs of living water will flow up from within them. How in the world is that possible? It's only possible when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and he begins to well up in and out of our lives. And so Paul is writing to the church and he's telling us something about God's plan for our salvation, is that God's plan for our salvation is that we should live a life that is continually full of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, when we read through scripture, I think what we will come to the conclusion is that to be filled or to continually be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit means that we are under the Holy Spirit's control. So when we're talking about what does it mean to live a life of continually being filled by the Holy Spirit, we're talking about living a life that means that we're controlled by the Holy Spirit through his influence in our thoughts, in our actions, our words, and our deeds, that God is working in us. Now, here's what I want you to, to understand. This is not optional 
for the Christian life. Paul isn't just making a suggestion here. He's speaking the authoritative words of God, divinely inspired, and he's giving us a biblical imperative. He's saying, I want you, John, to be filled, continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. I want every aspect of your life to reflect this new relationship that you have with God through faith. Be filled, continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, one would assume, depending on your doctrinal position, that if, if we hold to what some people would think and believe, that we have, at salvation, got as much of the Holy Spirit as we're going to get. He's moved in. He's taken up residence in the building. If that is absolutely the truth, and I, and I believe it is, we get the Holy Spirit at salvation, but there's a lot of me that needs to be worked out for him to begin to fill this vessel up. And that means there's a lot of areas in my life that I like to be in control of, and I'm not giving him free reign in. So there's more that God wants to do in our lives. There's more that God wants to bring into our lives, but we've got to be willing to relinquish control in some of these areas if we're going to experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives that the way the Bible is describing. Let me give you a couple of examples tonight from Scripture. I want you to put your hand on Acts chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 3, because Depending on what you think about the Holy Spirit and what it means to be filled by the Holy Spirit, we could arrive at two different conclusions tonight. We could arrive at the conclusion that you get all of the power, all of the feeling of the Holy Spirit immediately at salvation and there's no more to come. Or you could come to the conclusion that by the evidence that we see in our churches, by the evidence that we see in our own lives, that there is more of the Holy Spirit to be had and the more we're willing to submit our lives to his power and to his influence, the more our lives will be under his control, okay? Because there's not a single one of you here you could look at me honestly and say tonight that I have always walked in step with the Holy Spirit since I came to salvation. Anybody, raise your hand. I have always walked in step with the Holy Spirit from the moment I became a believer. Well, isn't he in you? Is he? Aren't you under his influence? Then why are you not always walking in step with the Holy Spirit? Don't you hate that? I don't know if you heard what he said. He said, free will. Remember, I talked about the conflict this morning, that there's a battle going on in our lives for who's going to be in control. It's either I'm going to be submitting to his influence and power in my life, or I'm going to do things my way. You can't have it the Burger King way and the Jesus way at the same time. It doesn't work that way. The Holy Spirit was given to lead you and guide you, not the other way around. If you were gonna put out a help wanted sign for waiters, what would your sign say? Wanted, guys who will work cheap, Work hard, work long, and not complain. Show up on time, do your job. Well, it's interesting that when the early church was starting and they had a disagreement about how the Jewish widows and the Grecian widows were being taken care of the church, 
It became such a point of division that the apostles were drawn away from the work that they were doing. And the primary work that God had given them was to lay the foundation of teaching and understanding for the new church to grow upon. And so they were being pulled away from this to be distributing food and needy supplies to the widows. And so they decided, you know what we need to do? We need to pass this off to some other men in the church who can be trusted. And it's interesting that the first qualification that they set down for hiring waiters are calling men to serve. And this, you, we need to pay attention to this because we're getting ready to enter into our election, not really an election, but make recommendations for men who will serve this body of believers as deacons. And so tonight what we're talking about is, is pertinent to where we are as a congregation. So if we're gonna look at men in this congregation who will serve as deacons, what should be the number one qualification? Should it be the number of Sundays they attend? Should it be uh, how much they give? Should it be who they're related to? You know, when we go looking for people to fill positions, we oftentimes base them on worldly counsel. We base them on worldly qualifications. So if we were looking for someone to fill a position of ministry, we would want to know, have they been to seminary? What kind of degrees do they have? If we're looking to put them on a committee, we want to know, if you're going to be serving on the finance committee, what's your experience in banking? What's your, are, you, are you a CPA? You know, and, and so we go looking for worldly qualifications when God said, I'm not going to run my church that way. It doesn't mean God's going to ignore worldly experience and qualifications, but that is not the thing that is of primary importance to God. My mouth is so dry. I did bring something to drink. Anybody lose an earring? It's in my bottle holder. So the church was in need of men to take care of the ministry. And look at what it says in Acts 6, verses 3 and 4. It says, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and give, them, give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, you have to ask yourself this question. Why in the world would the apostles lay down such a qualification? Think about it. If, if we all receive the Holy Spirit at salvation and we're all full of the Holy Spirit, then why wouldn't they say, just find six, eight, seven guys who are breathing and let them fill this position? I mean, isn't that what we would assume? I mean, You've already got all the Holy Spirit. You've already got all the Holy Spirit. So, you know, let's just take a pulse. And if you've got a pulse, let's plug you into the position. So why did they lay down this qualification? Help me out here. Ed. Okay. He directed them. All right. Would, could we safely assume from what is inferred, what is implied through the text, is that not everyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ is filled with the Spirit to the same measure? Because he is laying down a qualification for his church that being a Christian does not necessarily guarantee that a person is living a life that is controlled by the Holy Spirit. You know that, I know that from our own lives. There are times where we have been more under the control and the influence of the Holy Spirit than at others. I don't know if any of you have ever gone through a rebellious period in your spiritual life, whether it was in your teenage years or your young 20s or even in your 50s where you said, I'm just not going to do this. I know, Lord, that's what you said. I know that's what your word says, but I'm doing this. 
because I want to. Anybody? And God says, knock yourself out. Let's see how that goes for you. And usually it doesn't turn out real well, does it? You know what? You know what the Bible tells us? It teaches us that sin is fun for a season. Until we have to pay. Because sin always takes us farther than we expected to go, keeps us longer than we expected to stay, and it always costs us more than we thought we would ever pay. And so I believe God is making a point to the church that just being a Christian doesn't mean that you are living under the control of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. This is the message to the church in Laodicea. What do you know about this church? I mean, just from your memory, don't look at your Bibles. What do you remember about the church at Laodicea? All right, they're known as the lukewarm church. Man, what a great reputation to have. We're not hot, we're not cold. We're lukewarm, come right in. We don't get too excited, we don't get too low. We're just mediocre. Isn't that the kind of faith you would like to be known for? The church at Laodicea had a false perception of themselves. This is what makes it so scary, but yet so relevant. The church at Laodicea's vision of how they saw themselves was very different from how God saw them. I wonder if we ask the Lord about how close our own self-perception was to reality, what we would discover when it came to our own spiritual lives. Let me turn to that passage. Because I, I, I want you to hear what Jesus has to say to them. Revelation chapter three, I'm gonna back up to verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot, I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Listen to what he goes on to say. He says, you say I'm rich. I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. They saw themselves very differently from the way the Lord evaluated them. They saw their spiritual walk as being pristine. They saw their lives as being full. And they weren't just talking about their material wealth. I think they were talking about their own spiritual evaluation of themselves. And Jesus looks at them and he strips away the facade and what he sees behind it leaves him sick to his stomach because these people who have the Holy Spirit in them, this is what you gotta get. He's talking to his church, to one of the golden lampstands in the book of Revelation. And he's saying to them, you're in danger of losing your light because you believe you're walking in step with the Holy Spirit, living a life full of the Holy Spirit, and there, your life is anything but that. And what was his reaction to them? He says, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. So we gotta ask a question. What is a lukewarm Christian or a lukewarm church? It's a, 
It's a church or a believer who is living under the influence of religion, but lacking the depth of a genuine relationship. It's a church that is going through the motions. On the exterior, the facade looks great. But once you peel back the veneer, you see beneath it that this is a church that is doing their own thing or doing nothing. What are some of the metaphors in Scripture for the Holy Spirit? Wind? Fire. Fire is what? It's, it's power, but it's also heat. It's heat. What's some other metaphors of the Holy Spirit in the Scripture? Fire, wind, water. Most of the time, if I want a drink of water, I want it to be cold. If I want to sit by the fire, I want it to be hot. I, uh, nothing's worse than going camping and waking up in the morning and your fire's died down and maybe there's just a few coals. You really can't warm yourself up next to some dead ashes and a few live coals. You've got to blow it back to life and you've got to throw some more wood on the fire and you've got to get that fire going. Now, here's the thing. This is a church that Jesus looks at and he evaluates their spiritual walk. He evaluates their feeling of the Holy Spirit, their control by the Holy Spirit, and he says, what I see makes me sick. And, and, and here's what he's saying. He's saying to a church of spirit-filled believers, Holy Ghost, indwelt believers that I'm sick enough that I'm getting ready to what? Spit you out of my mouth. He didn't say to the angel of the so-called church in Laodicea, but he said to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This let me give you, just share a quote from Jim Cimbala here. He said, we're not sure what Jesus meant by hot or cold. We do know that one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit is fire, and fire, of course, is hot. It's easy to imagine how a spirit-controlled church could be on fire. Have you ever been a part of a church that was on fire? What does that look like? All right, you see, you see people coming to Christ. You see people being baptized. You see people being delivered. You see people's lives being changed. There is an atmosphere in the church that is contagious. And when you're a part of that, you want more of it. Because you feel the Holy Spirit's presence. You feel and sense his power at work. And, and, and to walk into a church that is cold, that is dead, that is stale, just makes you go, oh, I don't want any part of that. And so he said this, we can picture that cold means the opposite. Absolutely no evidence of the Holy Spirit, no fire, no flame. But this church was neither hot or cold. They're just lukewarm. Listen to the way the message puts it. He said, I know you inside and out and find little to my liking. You're not cold, you're not hot. Far better to be either cold or hot, you're stale. You're stagnant. You make me want to vomit. Let's go back to what Paul said in Ephesians. Paul said, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Rick, how often do you have to put gas in your vehicle? 
<laughs> quite often. Depends on what you're driving, doesn't it? Now, if I was to ask somebody who's driving a Prius, how often do you have to put gas in your vehicle? They would say not very often. Maybe 50 miles a gallon. But you know what? The determination about how often you need to refill your tank has nothing to do with how much fuel you consume per gallon, nor does it have anything to do with how much mileage you get per gallon. You know what determines how often you have to fill your tank? It's how far you drive. It's what you're doing. And so many Christians believe that, well, uh, I'm continually being filled, but the problem is they're not going anywhere. They're not doing anything. Is it any wonder that they're neither hot nor cold? It's because they're doing nothing. Their spiritual lives are stagnant. Their spiritual lives are stale. So why in the world would God pour any more of his spirit into them if they're not already using and utilizing what he's given them? So we have to ask the question, if all Christians are already filled with the Spirit at all times, why would this be such a strong command from Paul? When Paul says, you've come out of the darkness into the light, walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit. What does walking imply? I'm moving. I'm going somewhere. I'm doing something other than sitting and soaking in my spiritual life. So if I'm going to live by the Spirit, if I'm going to be filled by the Spirit, then I need to be moving. I need to be about God's business. I need to be sensitive to what his Holy Spirit is saying. Why? Because I need to know what the right thing for me to be doing is. And that will never happen apart from the control and the influence of the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. If I'm moving, I'm going to need to be filled a whole lot more frequently and more often than someone who's not doing anything. And if you're just moving in and of your own strength and power, folks, I'm going to tell you something. That is a recipe for spiritual burnout. You see, when we're under the control of the Holy Spirit's influence, we will be asking the right questions, we'll be making the right decisions, we won't make wrong commitments. And let me just say this to those of you who are on the edge of burnout, who are overcommitted, who are doing too much, if you are not continually being filled with the Holy Spirit and you're not continually understanding what the Lord's will is, everything Paul's talking about here in chapter five, if you're not in step with the Holy Spirit so that you understand what the Lord's will is, you will find yourself on the verge of spiritual burnout because you're doing the wrong things. It may be good things, but it's not the thing God's wanting you to do. Listen to what he says. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Is that not powerful advice? Is that not godly counsel? Be careful. How you live. If we're continually being filled with the Holy Spirit and we're learning what it means to walk in submission to Him and, and we're caring enough about what God has to say versus what we want that we're willing to crucify the flesh. So we talked about this morning. 
See, those who want to please the Lord because they love him are going to be willing to do the hard things that oftentimes we cannot do on our own. But because of the Holy Spirit who's in us, he's working as we cooperate with him to help us put to death those things in our life that don't belong. Why? Because when they die and they're buried, then there's more room for the Holy Spirit to have control. Does that make sense? That as the Holy Spirit helps you make those right decisions to put to death those things in your life that don't belong, it creates room. And so God's able to pour more in. Because there's less of you and there's more of him. He says, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Have I got a few minutes to finish? Okay. I'm going to go quick, so hang on. All right, so ask yourself this question. What prevents so many of us from fully surrendering ourselves to the Holy Spirit? All right, free will. Okay, we choose not to. All right, but what I'm asking is, why do we choose not to? What? All right, sin's, sin's one of the reasons what we like what we're doing. Okay, foolish. How about fearful? How, how many of you have ever wanted to say yes to God, but you were afraid what that yes would mean? Faith, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know? When you say yes to God, that means sometimes we've got to say no to other things. So many people are afraid if I say yes to God, then maybe he's going to ask me to go to Peru or do something crazy or stupid or, you know, something that's going to make me look foolish. And you know what? I don't like not being in control. I would much rather be in control. I want to serve God, but I also want to serve myself. And so because of fear of looking foolish or fear of what God's going to ask of us or what he's going to require of us, many of us say, you know what? I'm good right here. I think I'll just... Stay here, be happy. Hmm. And what I've discovered is that most of the time when I let fear rule my life, faith has little influence. Think about this. When the Holy Spirit shows up, you cannot always guarantee what he's going to do or what he's going to require of you or what he's going to ask you. When the Holy Spirit first filled those believers on the day of Pentecost, how many of them do you think knew what they were going to do next? When the Holy Spirit settled on them, they began to do things that they previously had been unable to do. Think about it. Because God was pouring out his spirit on them, those people began to do and say things that had previously been unable for them to do. And, and this isn't about speaking in tongues. This is about being under his influence or being under his control. Listen to what the Bible says in Acts chapter 2. It says, and when they heard this noise, talking about when the Holy Spirit came in like a wind and the fire began to settle on each and every one of them. It said that they began to hear the noise, talking about the crowd who was surrounding them. It says, and when they heard this noise, a crowd gathered and they were surprised because they were hearing everything in their own tongue, their own language. They were excited and amazed and said, don't all these who are speaking come from Galilee? then why do we hear them speaking our very own language? And, and in the text here, it is talking specifically about them hearing in their own language, not an unknown language, but their own language. I would venture to say that when God poured out his spirit on that day, none of them had previously been able to speak the languages they were speaking. And I also would venture to say 
that as God poured out his Holy Spirit that day, they maybe weren't speaking multiple languages. They were speaking one language, but each hearer heard the language in his own tongue. Either way is a miracle, is it not? Either, either way, for you to speak a language you've never heard, and you know what? That is scientifically proven. That has happened. They, they've got case studies where people have spoken languages that they had no knowledge of. Earthly languages. Not a heavenly one, earthly language. But I've never heard of a case where people have heard a language that they've never heard before and understood it. It doesn't usually work that way. Here, here's the irony of the situation. If we claim we want more of the Holy Spirit in our lives, but yet we let fear rule our lives, we will never have any more of the Holy Spirit than we do right now. The irony of spirit-filled living is that it has to, you've got to give up power in order to gain greater power. Why do I say that? Remember what we quoted this morning from Philippians chapter 2? That Christianity is not a self-effort religion, but rather one of power, the ability of his might and his spirit. And why does God do it this way? Why, why can we not learn everything that we need to know about the Christian life strictly from the Bible? And I'm not saying that there is other revelation out there that supersedes what the Bible is saying. I'm saying if, if the Holy Spirit wasn't necessary for us to live the kind of life that God wants us to live and to be the kind of people that he wants us to be, why would he have given it? I mean, if, if this was it... Without the imparting of the Holy Spirit, no one can even come to salvation. Much less read this book and understand it. Even though it's God's own words. Apart from the Holy Spirit, you can't come to Christ. You can't live the Christian life. You can't do it without him. You've got to be under his power and under his control. What did Jesus say? John 15, 5. He said, apart from me, what? What? You can do nothing. He said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. How do we connect with Jesus? We connect with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And if we're not living under his influence and under his control, guys, we're not connecting with Jesus. We're not connecting with the Holy Spirit who's within us. We're not connecting with God. Um, one of my favorite devotional writers on this passage, he said this, and I'll close because I, I think it is so relevant to what we're trying to get across. This statement, apart from me, you can do nothing, is one of the foundational truths of our discipleship. If we don't learn this early, listen to me, if we don't learn this early, we're gonna spend years of frustration trying to be the Christians God's called us to be. Our natural tendency is to try hard, be sincere, study diligently and train ourselves to be disciples we were meant to be. And there is a sense in which all this is good, even necessary if it's done with the knowledge that God is working in us as our enabler. But when we use all this self-effort to attain our own growth, we quickly find ourselves feeling like failures. We come to the startling conclusion, only Jesus, can live the Christian life. We can't. We can only have him live that life in us. That's why the Holy Spirit's there. That's why he's here. He said, Jesus is clear. He's not come to be our teacher, our God, our Savior, and our Lord. He's not come to be just those things. He is all of that and more. He is our life. 
In, in a very real sense, we died with him on the cross and he now lives in us. He breathes his spirit into us. He sustains us. He bears his fruit in us and he does his work in us and through us. When we think we lead others to Christ, we didn't. He did. When we think we've become patient, loving, or kind, or joyful, we only become so because he did that in us. We, it's all his work. Much of the Christian life, and this is what hammered me. He said, much of the Christian life is God stripping us of our self-effort so that we can live his life, so he can live his life in us without interference. We stress and strain over our discipleship, but God is after our unrelenting and our trust in his strength. When we find ourselves in circumstances beyond our control, frustrated from our lack of effectiveness, we can know we certainly, with certainty that we are to realize our weakness and rely on his strength. God will often put you in situations where you're over your head. Ever been there? He said, he's gonna put you in situations over your head, even letting you fail miserably sometimes in order to teach you this. He must break you of self-reliance. We are never to depend on our own strength and strategies. We are to be utterly dependent on God's power that works in us and over our circumstances. Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. And he does that through the Holy Spirit and he will work with what you give him. Let that be our final word tonight. If you wanna be under the Holy Spirit's control, you wanna walk in step with him, you wanna live a life of supernatural power, and, and I don't say that lightly, he will work with what you give him. And if you want more, You've got to surrender up more. Let's pray. Lord, tonight, we would often, if we're honest, say that our own spiritual evaluation of ourselves is way greater than what you probably see. And Lord, there's been so many times where we've depended on our gifting and our abilities and what you've already given us then, depending on you. And Lord, tonight, the first step that we need to take is to confess our, our reliance upon self, our reliance upon our intellect, our, our strength, our abilities and say, Lord, we're nothing without you. We're nothing apart from you. We can't do what you've called us to do. We can't be what you've called us to be. So Lord, tonight, help us empty ourselves. Let us empty ourselves of, of self-reliance. Let us empty ourselves of our high appraisal. And Lord, get on our faces before you and cry out with brokenness that we are empty and we need to be filled. Lord, all of the things that are in our lives right now that have no place, that have no belonging, Lord, that are taking up space that you intend to use, that you intend to fill, Lord, tonight, let us get rid of that and right now, the Holy Spirit has put his hand on places in your life that are filled with something other than him. He's walking through the midst of this congregation tonight, and he's laying his hand on places in your heart, in your mind, in your life, and he's saying, this, this doesn't belong. You need to let go of this. You need to give this up. You need to walk away from that because I have something better. I have something wonderful I want to do there. But as long as you hang on to what you're holding, you cannot receive what I want to give you. You got to let it go. You got to crucify it. 
you got to bury it and then start moving. For some of you sitting here tonight, your biggest hindrance to living the spiritual filled life is your lack of movement. You're content where you are and you've become stale. You've become stagnant. It's time to let God rekindle the fire in you and under you. Lord Jesus, you sent your Holy Spirit, and so many times we totally ignore him. Tonight, Father, hope in our hearts. Holy Spirit, even as we say that, it seems strange to us to talk to you like we talk to God the Father and God the Son. Holy Spirit, you are our lives. You're in us. You're with us. Help us to walk and step with you and be aware of your presence like we have never been before and to be willing to follow you wherever you lead us. In Jesus' name and for his glory, and all God's children said, Amen. Amen.